Hello, I'm Adrian Solis, a principal software engineer on Teams platform. I lead a group of developers who work with partners building apps for Teams. You may have seen us on GitHub, Stack Overflow, email. Maybe you've read our blog posts and sample code. Or perhaps you've worked with us directly at hackathons and other partner events. And I'm Erin Bailey. I'm an ecosystem PM on Microsoft Teams, and I work with partners who are writing apps to go into the Teams store. I help them with the full life cycle of app development from envisioning, development, and marketing launch. We're going to talk about the app development process, and we'll take you through the four phases of app development. Envisioning your app, implementing it, debugging it, and then publishing it. Lastly, we'll share some resources and tips for writing and publishing an app in Teams. Before we get to the first stage in app development, which is envisioning, we should talk about apps in Teams. An app in Teams needs to have at least one item from each column in this slide. Apps need to have a capability, and they need to work in a scope. Lots of apps in Teams have more than one item from each column. But instead of telling you more about these, let's take a look. I'll show you an app called Contoso. We'll start by talking about bots. Bots let you get things done as a team or on your own. They can post information proactively to a channel, and they can respond to queries. Here, we see a Contoso bot has posted to a channel, and a user has sent a request to get more information. In this case, a list of the team's tasks. Next on our tour are tabs. This is a Contoso tab. It's been pinned to a channel. All the users in the channel have the same view of this project board, and they can have a conversation about what they're seeing. But each user's personal project list may be different, which is why personal tabs are useful as well. Here, we have a user's personalized Contoso tab, and it shows all of their tasks across different projects. Next is an example of a message extension. A user is searching for information in Contoso, and they insert an adaptive card, an actionable containerized UI element to post into the channel. So far, we've shown you the channel and personal context, and we've shown you tabs, bots, and message extensions. In our last example, let's look at meetings, which are an extension of group chats. Here's the Contoso app in a meeting. You can see that the meeting organizer can view a few polls to send out over the course of the call and see the responses as they come in. Now that we know the basic construction of an app in Teams, we can get to the development process, which starts with envisioning. When you're deciding to build an app in Teams, start by defining the scope and the scenario that your app will cover. Ask yourself, who are the users I want to empower? And what workflows do I want to bring to Teams? Focus on solving real world relevant problems. Think about broad impact for many users. Try to focus on solutions that have a high impact. You could try to reduce the mean time to resolution or cut down the bug count. These are a few goals that Teams apps can help solve. Once you know the scenarios, you can create the app model that fits those scenarios. Have a collaborative scenario? Put it in a channel or a meeting context. Is it something for personal productivity? Use a personal app. Think about the durability of the information shown in your app as well. Is it a temporary view? You could use a task module UI element. But if it's something that should be searchable or discoverable in the long run, try using a tab or an adaptive card in a chat. So after you've considered your app's flows and selected the capabilities that you're targeting for your app, you're probably eager to start building. If you've worked on a Teams app before, you're already familiar with how these capabilities work and are ready to, to start implementation. On the other hand, if you're just getting started, I recommend that you experiment first and try out some samples to validate your plan. Either way, it's best to begin with a quick start to generate a starter code for your application. Now at Build this year, we announced the Microsoft Teams Toolkit extensions for Visual Studio and Visual Studio Code. You can install them from these links on screen or through the extension managers of each IDE. We have a range of samples in our docs page and in the bot framework samples repo. Check them out. They're especially helpful if you're looking for a code snippet that demonstrates a specific technique, like implementing a task module, maybe a messaging extension, or sending a proactive message to a set of users. 
And if you're looking for full end-to-end examples of solutions built on Teams, I recommend that you look at our catalog of app templates. These apps implement entire scenarios, and they're ready for you to deploy and try out. We have about 30 of them in our catalog right now, and we're building more. We include doc- detailed documentation for them, and we hope that makes them good starting points for you to customize further. Another reason f- to use the toolkits for generating a scaffolding for your app is that they pull in the right base set of libraries and SDKs for you. For instance, when you create a tab app with the Visual Studio Code Toolkit, you'll find that it includes the Teams JavaScript library, which is a prerequisite for all iframe content inside Teams like tabs, task modules, and connector configurations. It also includes the Fluent UI React components, which are a set of components for React that are styled like the ones that we use inside Teams itself. These two libraries are are what you'll use when developing hosted experiences inside Teams. Now, if you were to generate the starter code for a bot or a messaging extension, the toolkit will include the corresponding SDK for the Microsoft bot framework. This SDK is available in various languages. The .NET, JavaScript, and Python SDKs are ready for production release, while the Java SDK is in development and is currently in preview. We also have libraries that help you use Microsoft Graph. If you use this, note that there's a separate one for graph endpoints that are still in beta. So when you're taking advantage of these APIs, remember to include the beta version of the SDK inside your application. So sign in is is a significant friction point for any app. We see users drop off when presented with a sign in prompt, and we've worked hard to streamline the process with single sign on for tabs and soon also for bots. We recommend that you take this further and make the auth experience pretty smooth for your app by sharing user information between its functions. Now, although, as Aaron explained, the Teams app is composed of individual capabilities like bots, tabs, messaging extensions, and perhaps graph integrations as well, to the user, it's just one app. So we encourage you to, to share information between these functions and capabilities to present a unified front. The common key that's available across all these capabilities is the user's tenant ID and Azure AD object ID. So this is the key that you should use when storing information about the user. In your tab or task module, you use SSO to get an access token for the user, which on your server you'll validate and examine the TID and OID claims to get the tenant ID and object ID respectively. This process is even easier for bots and messaging extensions because every activity sent to your bot includes this information automatically, so you can get it directly from the payload. When designing and implementing your app, it's helpful to consider the different kinds of Teams users that your app will encounter. The first most common kind of user is one who is a member of an organization that uses Microsoft 365 and who is using Teams inside their own organization. Now, when they are invited to be a guest in a team that belongs to a different org, they become a guest user there. Even though they still log in with their username and password from their home tenant, note that the guest identity is effectively a new user in the other tenant. You'll see a different object ID and user principal name for this user. If you need to distinguish between guests and regular user, what you can do is ask Graph for their user details because guests will have a user type property that indicates that they are a guest and not a user. And with the new meeting extensibility apps, you'll start seeing a new user type, anonymous meeting participants. These are participants who joined the meeting from a meeting join link and who didn't sign into Teams. They exist only for the duration of the meeting, and you'll see that they're unique in that they don't have a corresponding entry inside Azure AD. So if you ask Graph about them, you won't get an answer at this point. If you're creating an app that's meant to be used for meetings, please be aware of these anonymous participants and consider all of these types. Think about what each user type should or should not be allowed to do inside your application, and remember to test these scenarios. One more thing, 
when signing in to the Microsoft Identity Platform, we recommend that you always use the tenant-specific endpoint shown above. This endpoint handles both organizational and guest users correctly and returns a token for your intended tenant, which is typically the one that the user is currently signed into, whether they're a regular user in that tenant or a, a guest user from a different organization. We see some apps use a common endpoint, which has a string common instead of the tenant ID. Now using this endpoint will sign in guest and team's free users to the wrong organization, and that leads to failures during the app validation process. Speaking of app validation and authentication, a cardinal rule that we check during validation is that apps that implement sign-in must also provide a way to sign out or disconnect from their service. This slide here has an overview of the recommended way of presenting this option to the user, which depends on the capability as, as you can see. Basically, if the user can sign in through your bot, they should also be able to disconnect through a bot command. Users interact with Teams apps in different ways. Some people might use a bot, might prefer to use a bot, or they may, others may prefer to use a tab. And it's often disorienting to allow signing in through one capability, but then only allow logging out through a different one. Now, a final note on logging out. If you use the Microsoft Identity Platform as your authentication provider, please be careful not to use the single sign out endpoint when signing out of a tab. Remember that Teams itself uses Azure AD. So triggering a single sign out will make the user log out of Teams too, which is often not what you intended. In this case, we recommend that you clear all the state on your server and state on the local machine, such as cookies, local storage, and index DB content, and start afresh the next time that the user visits your tab. Now let's talk a bit about debugging. When I develop apps for Teams, there are a few must-have tools that I find absolutely indispensable. First is the reverse proxy, so I can run bots and tabs locally. These are tools like ngrok or the Tunnel Relay project that we publish on our GitHub repo, and they let me debug my app inside Visual Studio or Visual Studio Code while it's running on my machine. Now you can debug your app while it's running on the cloud up in Azure, I've done that, but trust me, it's faster to do it locally. Now, ngrok and Tunnel Relay also have nifty interfaces that show you the requests received by your app and your app's response. Even if you use the bot framework SDK, I would encourage you to occasionally take a few minutes to look at the raw JSON payload as well. Sometimes it has information in there that, that you may not know existed because we've relied too much on IntelliSense or on, on the uh, the models that are provided by the SDK. And it, it's interesting to take a look at what, the, what your bot actually ends up receiving. A web debugging proxy like Fiddler or Charles is another useful tool. Th this kind of proxy is a complement of the reverse proxy. While ngrok shows you the incoming requests, Fiddler will show you the outgoing ones. When I see an error in my bot while it's sending a message, or even when in Teams while I'm uploading something like a, a package or, or a manifest, I turn to a tool like Fiddler. We've improved the error messages returned by our services, and often the response content of the request is, fail is enough for me to figure out what happened and fix it. The browser dev tools window is also handy during debugging. Now, this window lets you see the JavaScript console check cookies, local storage, index DB contents, and basically inspect and manipulate your pages DOM, among other things. Now, if you didn't know, you can bring up this window in the Teams desktop client and also in the Teams Android app by following these instructions in our doc pages. All right, you've built your scenarios and you're ready to test out your app and deploy it to users. First, you should decide how you're going to deploy your app. If you're testing locally, or if you only want to deploy to one organization, you can have a Teams admin upload the app as a line of business app through their admin portal. However, we always encourage publishing to the Teams app store. You'll get exposure to the over 75 million daily active users of Teams, and you'll enjoy easy discovery and management of the app through the Teams store and the Partner Center. Should you choose to publish globally, you'll do so through the Microsoft Partner Center. 
and your app will be listed in App Source and the Teams Store. Start by checking out the Teams developer documentation for checklists and automated checkers for your app to ensure that it's ready for submission. Then use the Partner Center to submit your app for validation and publish. Give our team at least two weeks to validate and set up the regression testing for your app. And once they're done, your app will be live in the store and ready for users. We hope that this was a good intro to the process of envisioning and building a Teams application and that you picked up some helpful tips and techniques. Here's some other content and resources that you'll find useful. There's a neat guidebook at akams slash build teams app guide that dives deep into designing, building, and publishing an app for Microsoft Teams. Also, please download and use the Visual Studio extensions that I mentioned earlier at akams Teams Toolkit BS and akams Teams Toolkit. Finally, there's a ton of interesting content here at Ignite. Please check them out. We highly recommend these ones on screen as they relate beautifully with the topics that we just covered today. Lastly, thanks for joining us today. We hope you enjoy the rest of your sessions at Ignite.